Hey everyone, welcome to Logan's Mosh Pit. Glad to have you here. Do me a favor and please subscribe if you haven't already. Buckle up because it's time for another episode of Rock and Read. Today we'll read chapter 6 of Red by the Red Rocker, Sammy Hagar. Chapter 6 is called I Can't Drive 55. Let's see how Sammy came up with such a phenomenal song. Here we go. I found a home in Mill Valley. I had been renting this place, but when the lady who owned the house decided to sell, I knew I had to buy it. My heart and soul were already in it. Buffalo arranged for Capital to give me an early advance on my next album after Red so that I could put the down payment on this architectural wonder of a house. It was on top of Mount Tam in Mill Valley called Tamalpas Pavilion, and I could barely afford the house, but I knew I wanted to live there. A Frank Lloyd Wright protege named Pafford Keaton Tinge Clay, a British-born architect, built the place for himself, got divorced, and lost it. He built this house out of cement and glass and steel reinforced concrete, the first pre-stressed concrete house in architectural history. He built another one just like it in Switzerland, and he built a bank in Pasadena that's exactly double in size, and that was it. Glass all the way around. Eight concrete columns hold everything up. The roof is sitting on top of it. It's not bolted down whatsoever. I scraped up the $60,000 down payment from Capital, and the owner carried me for the other hundred grand. I didn't know how I was going to make the payments, but I managed. I still live there today. When it was being built, a filmmaker named John Cordy lived down the street and watched the endless parade of cement trucks driving past his door. He wrote a script about a guy whose house burned down. An earthquake destroyed his next house, and then another one the termites ate, and he was a termite inspector. He freaked out and built this cement house that was bulletproof. That's the story of Crazy Quilt, a kind of cult classic among early American independent films. That's my house in the movie. The Red Album had a little success. It sold about 100,000 albums. After the tour, Carter and I went straight back to England to make musical chairs. That album had a sort of top 40 hit, You Make Me Crazy. That was me trying to write like Van Morrison. When it was time to hit the road in support of musical chairs, I landed the Boston tour. The group was the big new rock band of 1977. First, they went out opening for Black Sabbath, but quickly graduated to Headliner. Boston hired me as the opening act for the whole tour. The first leg lasted nine months with a break for Boston to go in and record their second album. While Tom Scholz and the rest of Boston did that, I went out and did a miniature headline tour and did pretty good. Small arenas, three and four thousand seaters in Texas and Southern California. Then I went back and did the second Boston tour for 11 months starting in fall 1978, opening every night, two and three nights in every venue in America. There were only a few places where I could pull that off. San Francisco, San Jose, Santa Cruz, Santa Monica, San Bernardino, and San Antonio, Texas. Those were the six markets where I could go make five grand. Leffler would have put me in those markets while I was out touring, opening for other people, and do quick little headline shows to keep me alive. On that first little headline tour, I did the craziest thing. I made a live album all night long, and that became my next release in 1978. Oddly enough, the live album sold about 250,000 records. I was starting to break. You could see it. My record was selling with no singles, no radio airplay, no nothing. Just 21 months of non-stop touring. On my next album, Street Machine, I parted company with Carter and decided to produce it myself. For years, Carter had been giving me these dumb songs, always trying to give me a top 40 hit, trying to get me to do covers like Dock of the Bay. When I'd finally been over backwards and done Dock of the Bay, covering Otis Redding, for God's sakes, with guitarist Steve Cropper, who wrote the song, it didn't even work. I had brought the guys from Boston over to Wally Hyder studio in San Francisco after a May 1979 Day on the Green concert we played across the bridge in Oakland before 55,000 fans, and they sang background vocals. That was supposed to be a shot at the top 40 thing, but even KFRC in my hometown would not touch it. I was already headlining concerts in the Bay Area for promoter Bill Graham, but they wouldn't play my records on the radio. I'd given Capital I've Done Everything For You on my live album, a song that two years later 
was a top 10 hit for Rick Springfield, but they hadn't been able to get one radio station for me. To top 40 radio, I was a heavy metal guy. By the time I went into the studio to record Street Machine, I was over trying to get a top 40 hit. That record sold about 350000 when it was released in September 1979. After years of opening concerts for everybody and their uncle, people started to think I could be a headliner. Louis Messina of Pace Concerts in Texas packaged me with Pat Travers, who was on the charts with the hit Boom Boom, Out Go the Whites and the Scorpions, the German hard rock band who were just starting out in this country. We sold out everywhere. It was unbelievable. We were doing 10, 12,000 seats. It was a low ticket price and it was a package deal, but it was the first time I did a headline tour. Capitol Records still didn't get me. I had just done a headline tour selling out arenas and they couldn't get me past 350,000 records. My business had quadrupled. Not just the box office, but t-shirts, everything. I was becoming a genuine rock star on stage. In England, I was on the cover of Melody Maker and the new musical Express. They took a picture of me in shorts, high socks, tennis shoes, and a tank top with my Trans Am and my Explorer. I looked mean. One headline said, Van Halen, look in your rear view mirror. We sold out 14 theater shows in England before we even left this country. My last album for Capital Danger Zone, released in June 1980, simply reinforced that Capital did not know what to do with me. It sold another 350,000 copies, even though I was packing venues all over America. I sold out the Oakland Coliseum Stadium that 4th of July. Originally, Tom Scholz, the genius guitarist behind Boston, was going to produce. He came out and did pre-production, but his record company decided he should be working on another Boston album, not somebody else's record. They were going to sue him, so he left. The next day, I hired somebody I knew named Geoff Workman at the last minute because we were already kind of in the studio, ready to go. Workman, an engineer who worked with Queen's producer, had just finished recording an album with Journey and their new lead vocalist Steve Perry, and I liked what I heard. Schultz was upset that I replaced him so quickly, but I told him I didn't have money to burn. I needed to get going and get back on the road. That's when I really broke wide open. Touring in support of Danger Zone, I saw it was really starting to happen for me. I saw it with my own eyes. At every concert, people were singing my songs. They knew who I was. I could see it coming every night. From the time I began playing music, I would put my nose to the grindstone, head down, rolled up my sleeves, and went forward. I would never made it, and I would never had any money. When I came back, my accountant told me I had $300,000 in the bank. What do you want to do, she said. I'd made an album a year for the five years at Capitol while I was touring constantly. I would come off the road and go in the studio. If I wasn't touring, I was making a record. The label paid tour support, but because my records weren't selling that well and I was constantly on the road, I wasn't earning out the expenses. I had done well in England and other European countries, but Capitol never paid me a single royalty. In fact, they told me I owed them $175,000. I had a really bad record deal. I was getting about 20 cents a record. I was spending more money on tour than I was earning. I decided to sue Capital. John Kolodner, the big cheese A&R man at Jeffen Records, wanted me to sign to the label David Geffen had just started. At one point, he had only signed John Lennon and Donna Summer. They offered me a million dollar deal. I was getting 50 grand a record from Capital and owed them money, but the money Geffen gave me paid for the lawsuit. One day we walked into court at Marin Civic Center and the judge told Capitol, I think you folks have made enough money off this young fella. He let me out of the deal. I walked away a free man. Geffen broke me on the charts. I finally had hit records that matched my box office on the road. Capitol never managed that. Capitol didn't market me. They didn't give a crap. It was especially sweet when I signed with Geffen and shoved it up Capitol's butt with my first gold and my first platinum album. That was the beginning of a 16-year streak of million-seller albums. Claudner was the greatest A&R guy. He got Jimmy Petrick of Survivor to co-write a song with me, Heavy Metal, and it sold to the movie even before my album came out. Jonathan Kane of Journey and I co-wrote a song, too. Claudner tried to put me together with different writers, but I didn't feel like writing with other people. 
I was not that confident to be sitting around a guy I didn't really know and showing my ideas. I would start tightening up. I didn't feel like I could express myself well enough. Besides, I take everything personally, but I wrote 28 songs for that album. Kalodner suggested Keith Olsen as producer, and I liked that idea. Olsen produced Fleetwood Mac and Pat Benatar. We made a great record, Standing Hampton, no question about it, with an instant top 40 hit, All Fall in Love Again. When it was released in January of 1982, we went out on tour, headlining arenas, double nights in a lot of places, and I became rich and famous right then and there. After Geffen signed me, everything changed. The turn of fate that happened in my life was unbelievable. I had plenty of money for my record deal with Geffen, and Kowalder didn't want me to even think about going out on the road. For the first time in my adult life, I was home for almost a year. Since I had started in the business, I had never been home. Betsy was happy as a lark. I built a swimming pool for my house. I grabbed my old pal David Walser, who was with me in the Justice Brothers, and put a band together. I had money. I had a band. I had a crew. For years, I had been working my ass off. Family life was something that just sort of happened to me. I barely noticed. I would got married and had a baby while I was struggling with the band. When my son was a child, I went out on the road. I couldn't always afford it, but even after I could afford it, taking Betsy and a small child were never easy. When Aaron was older, we put him in a boarding school, North Country School in Lake Placid, New York, and Betsy started going on tour with me. But she couldn't stand touring. She hated flying. She didn't like hotel rooms and living out of suitcases. My marriage was always a struggle. If she wasn't on the road every night, calling home meant arguments. I was messing around a lot, as much as I could. I still wasn't doing drugs or falling down drunk, but I started living the life a little bit. I tried not to get involved in anything serious. That way I could at least convince myself that I wasn't really doing any damage. Almost across the street from Aaron's school, on the highway, there was this log cabin that was for sale and wasn't expensive. It was a log cabin kit with a big loft, five acres in the back. I bought it, and we tried to spend as much time as possible there, but I was always on tour. We'd go back there for Thanksgiving. That was the law. They didn't allow students to go home for Thanksgiving because they had this big deal Thanksgiving feast that the kids prepared. We went back there for Thanksgiving. That was about it. Success really motivated me. Ed Weffler was amazed. You're different than anyone I've ever met in this business, he told me. Fame and fortune inspire you. You get better. I've never known anyone in my entire life like that in the music industry. The more success you have, the better you get. You jump on that stage now. You're so much better than you were when you were hungry. When I was hungry, I lacked confidence. I was afraid to let my heart and soul out. I was hiding. I was faking it. It seeped through. You could hear it in my voice. My actions were not true and honest, so they didn't connect. I was bluffing, acting the part. It took fame and fortune for me to become myself. That gave me the confidence I needed to bring out what I really have to offer. Whatever it is, I started to get more real. I took what was left of that big money advance from Geffen and started buying property in Fontana. I don't think I would have had that much longevity as a rock star, and I never wanted to be poor again. My mom instilled that in me. You've got to have something to fall back on. I started building apartment buildings in Fontana. I went to my brother-in-law, James, who was an electrical contractor and had gotten a contractor's license. My nephew also became an electrician, and one of their friends became the plumber. I made them all partners. We built nine apartment buildings. I bought the old houses we rented when I was growing up. That was my first entrepreneurial effort, and we did really well. Shortly after we started building the apartments, the fire department came to my brother-in-law and said, he needed to put a fire hydrant in front of every apartment building. He told the fire department that his plumber could put fire sprinklers in the building that would be more effective for about the same price. The insurance companies went along because sprinklers put out fires before fire departments could even get there, but the fire department needed some convincing. We staged a demonstration for them. We bought one of my old houses, sprinkled it, and then lit a fire in a trash can. We waited for the neighbors to call the fire department, which was parked, waiting, right down the street, and by the time they got there, the sprinklers put everything out. The house was still totally cool. Fire sprinkling is amazing. It really saves lives. The city passed an ordinance and gave us some money. Before long, we had 180 employees and ran the second largest fire sprinkler company in America, Fire Chief Inc. 
The next thing I did was the travel agency. I started a travel agency because I was traveling so much for tours that I was paying my travel agent a small fortune. I decided to start my own. Steady State Travel in Mill Valley hired the two ladies that used to work for the old travel agency and gave them a piece of the action. It didn't make a lot of money, but it also didn't cost me anything when I went on tour. I started Red Rocker Clothing, which was a disaster, because the rag trade is the craziest business in the world. I had this great idea to make these upscale flannel shorts. I bought the flannel from Ralph Lauren. He had this line of flannel shirts and stuff, and it was the baddest flannel. I lost probably $300,000 because I got a huge order I couldn't fill from J.C. Penney's. I was late. I ended up with $65,000 worth of these flannel shorts in my warehouse because they wouldn't take them. Some of them didn't have buttons. I was trying to rush them out so fast. The next year, everybody had flannel shorts. Very tough business. You come up with an idea, and the next year, everybody flat rips you off, and you have to come up with something fresh. I bowed out. While well, I lost some money on the clothes, I ended up starting something else that made money. Bike stores. It was Bucky who got me into the bikes. Bucky, my old pal, who I used to help steal albums from the ABC store and who turned me on to Fresh Cream, was living in an apartment on B Street in San Rafael with his wife Joel and their son Benny. He'd married her in Rochester, but she ran away with some other guy and they split up for a while. Bucky took her back after he moved to California, which is when they had their kid. Bucky was always around. I took him to England with me as my roadie and truck driver when we did Red. Ed Leffler loved him, but he was tough on the other guys. He was hardcore and always looking out for me. He was into drugs and drinking and could be an hole. We had to cool him out from time to time. Eventually, Bucky took a job at this bike shop, the Court Madura Cyclery, an old-time Swin dealership. That was right around the time that two guys named Steve Potts and Gary Fisher were inventing the mountain bike in Marin County. They took a fat tire cruiser bike and put gears on it from a 10-speed. They rode these bikes up and down on Mount Tam. One day, Bucky took me in the back of the dealership and made me a mountain bike. Right away, Bucky and I were riding our bikes everywhere. He biked to work every day, rain or shine. Between his biking and mine, I saw the mountain bike business coming, and it really appealed to me. He told me I could buy the store for around $75,000. Pretty cheap. All I had to do was buy the inventory, and it was a small store. I bought the store, and he started making mountain bikes. We were the mountain bike kings. All these guys were bringing their cruisers to Bucky, and he converted them to mountain bikes. At the store, Bucky couldn't put mountain bikes together fast enough. We had to hire mechanics. Seeing the success of that store, I had an idea to open an even bigger bike store, a super store that would carry bike clothing and accessories. I built the Sausalito Cyclery. We were the number one independent bike store in California, one of the top ten in the country. We were doing $4 million a year in sales out of that place, with a $1 million in inventory on the floor. I bought the top. You couldn't even get into the store half the time. We were blasting 20 to 30 high-end bikes a day out there. When the first commercial models from Specialized came out, mountain bikes started taking off. We bought them. We started seeing the trend. People started buying these things. They were trading in their road bikes. Pretty soon, we couldn't even take trade-ins because nobody wanted road bikes anymore. We put mannequins in the store with the bike clothing and we got a review in a bike magazine saying we were the only bike store in America that displays clothing on mannequins. I made my own mountain bike, the Red Rocker. I landed the cover of Mountain Bike Magazine with that thing. I had two lights on it and I was the first bike builder to use black components. Before the Red Rocker, everything was chrome. You had the bike, whatever color. You had black tires, sometimes white walls. Everything else was chrome. I wanted everything red and black, no chrome. It took me a year and a half. Gary Fisher made me frames. There were different gear people in Japan. They made me enough parts for 100 red rockers, two water bottles, two mag lights, and all black components, rims, spokes, bolts. It was a really badass machine. We sold out instantly. Bang. Gone. We had 10,000 back orders from around the country. We went back to Japan where our suppliers told us the most they would make was 300 this year. Meanwhile, here comes Specialized with their red and black rock hopper. Rock hopper? Red rocker? Pure coincidence, I'm sure, and they stepped on me. 
They had components for 50,000 bikes. I got out of the business, but I was pissed. I had been totally ready to take over the mountain bike world. The Sausalito store was a gold mine, but Bucky wasn't running the place. He couldn't. He'd show up late and yell, F*** you at someone and walk out. Everybody loved him, but you couldn't put him in charge. Instead, he worked the floor. After months of this, I finally had to sell Cord to Madura because Sausalito killed it. Everyone came to Sausalito because it was built right on the bike path. With all these different businesses going on outside of my music, I was making some money, and I began buying things. I bought a couple of other houses beyond the one in Marin County. I started getting into Ferraris. I started developing a taste for fine wines. One night when I was in Montrose, I had tasted a 1945 Latour and a 1927 Martinez poured on the same night, and I started to build a collection of fine wines. I made concert promoters provide me with certain vintage bottles backstage as part of my contractual requirements and take them home unopened. Bill Graham was hip to my chisel. He had all five bottles in my dressing room opened, so I couldn't take them home, and, and later gave me a recorking machine as a gift. I just started living the life. Betsy was able to spend a lot of money too. She'd go shopping and refurnish the house. I'd come home and go, what? But since I was doing okay financially, I didn't really care. Things still weren't going great between us though, and around then, I finally had an affair. I had been screwing around on the road here and there for years, but this was different. This was a real affair where I fell in love with another person. She was in the record business. I met her when I was recording my first album with Geffen in 1981. She represented a music publisher and maybe had a song for me. She was so independent. She lived by herself, owned her own house, drove a new car, worked hard at a good job, the opposite of Betsy. I fell in love with her and I began a long running affair. I'd fly her out on tour. Betsy would leave and she would come in. I used to fake trips to Los Angeles to see her. I'd fly down for the day. She'd pick me up at the airport. We'd go to her house and have insane sex. She was so liberated. I loved that about her. It was like, my God, this woman can take care of me. After the affair had been going for two years, I was ready to leave Betsy, but then I decided that first we needed to take a family vacation, this big trip to Africa. Betsy, Aaron, and I went to Italy, Serendina, Egypt, and Kenya, where we spent six weeks on a safari. We were gone the whole summer of 1983. I was looking to figure out what I was going to do with my girlfriend. I needed to figure myself out. I was planning on leaving Betsy. I was in love. We were in Sardinia. Aaron was out at the pool and Betsy and I had a quick daytime throwdown. It was a beautiful day and everything was right. I knew immediately she was pregnant. That had happened the first time with Aaron too. This time, we did it while we were listening to Pro Cole Harem Salty Dog album on a tiny record player in a hotel room, and afterward, I just knew. In Sardinia, it wasn't like it was amazing sex or something, it was actually kind of a quickie deal, but you could tell something happened. Sure enough, we got to Africa, and Betsy's kind of sick all the time in the morning. We arrived at the Mount Kenya Safari Club just in time to see Robert De Niro leaving. He was with this little kid and a white-haired guide in a Land Rover pulling out as we pulled up. It was a British-style old colonial. I hated that place. After 5 o'clock, men were required to wear a coat and a tie. Women had to be in evening gowns. Children weren't even allowed out of their rooms after 5 o'clock. Betsy was sick. She couldn't leave the room anyway. They treated you real well and the place was gorgeous, but it was stupid fancy. It was a bird sanctuary. They had these black guys with white gloves and tuxedos going around with little brooms and buckets sweeping up bird poop. But best coffee I ever had in my life? Mount Kenya Safari Club, no question. Anyway, we went all over Kenya and Tanzania on these safaris like the governor's camp, which is camping but very elegant. De Niro was there. He was on the same safari I was, either coming or going. A couple times we'd see each other in the bar, had a couple words, Hi, I'm a big fan, yeah. He didn't know who I was, but he knew I was somebody. Long hair, hippie looking dude in this place. Going home we flew from Kenya to London. 14 hours and changed to the Concorde. I was really splurging. First class all the way. Flew from Concorde to New York. Changed planes for Albany where I picked up a rent-a-car and started driving to our log cabin in Lake Placid where Aaron went to school. We were taken back to North Country School to start in September. It was 2 o'clock in the morning when the cop pulled me over. We'd been traveling for 24 hours. I was 
burnt. When I was out of the country, they had changed the speed limits. The cops started writing me the ticket. Officer, I said, I was only going 62. Around here, he said, we give tickets for 62. He was parked behind some trees on a four-lane highway. Nobody on the road. The middle of the night. I looked at Betsy. I can't drive 55, I said. As, as soon as I heard myself say it, I went, whoa. Grabbed some paper and a pen. I started writing the lyrics. As he's writing the ticket, I'm writing the lyrics. The cop came back. He handed me the ticket, and I said, thank you, sir. I went straight to my house in Lake Placid, a three-hour drive from Albany. By the time we got there, it was about five o'clock in the morning. I had a guitar and an amp in my basement. I went downstairs, picked up my guitar, turned on the little tape recorder, and wrote the song right there on the spot. The whole time we were in Africa, I had been writing songs, because I knew I was coming back to do this thing with Neil Sean of Journey, my first idea of a supergroup, H-S-A-S, -S, Hagar, Sean, Arison, Shreve. Neil and I had it all planned. When I got back and found out Betsy was pregnant, I kind of decided to end my affair, or at least start slowing down. I had a pregnant wife on my hands, and I thought this wasn't the time to leave anybody. It ripped me up because I was really in love with this woman, too. But the day Betsy went into the hospital to have Andrew on June 4, 1984, I called the girl from my music publisher from the hospital and cut it off. I got a new baby boy, I told her. I'll never see you again. I never did. When a baby's born, it is a miracle. You can read the Bible or other books and you hear about miracles. You want something to affect you and change your life like that? You want to see Jesus walk on water? You want to see someone heal, take a cripple and make him walk? You want to see those things. We all want that. When you see a baby born, you see that. It shipped me right into shape. I had the whole world in my hands, and I watched this baby being born. I was ready to give up anything for that, for my kids and my wife, so that we could continue to be that family together. There's just something about seeing a child being born. Creation. Isn't that as close to God as you're ever going to get? When I turned my focus back to HSAS, I had all these songs like Giza and Valley of the Kings that I had written in Africa and Egypt. These five be kind of lyrics, and I had I Can't Drive 55 because I had written it on the way home. But I didn't give it to the band. I didn't even tell Neil. I just kept it in my pocket. I wrote the whole song anyway, and Neil and I were supposed to be co-writing everything on the new project. I don't think I was being cheesy or cagey, just that this was my song and I saved it for myself. Good thinking, it turned out. The HSAS thing didn't really work. Neil and I had wanted to do something together, but I don't know why we got bassist Kenny Aronson and drummer Michael Shrave. They were good and everything, but it was more a matter of who was available. Aronson had played with Billy Squire, and Neil knew Shreve from when they would played in Santana together. Shreve, who's a great rhythmical guy, wasn't a rock drummer at all, and we were a rock band, but he made the band kind of cool and fusion-y. We did 12 shows in November 1983 around the Bay Area, all sold out for a band nobody had ever heard of before, and gave all the money to arts and music programs and public schools. We cut the album live, which I thought was sort of adventurous, but it never sold more than 150000 even though I was selling more than a million as a solo artist and Journey was selling more than a million with Neil. It never caught on. A Wider Shade of Pale, which was the single, didn't really work, never hit. We played an MTV show called The Concert, Neil and I went to New York and did press for days, but it just never took off. It might have been better if we'd gone in the recording studio, made the record, and then done the shows, but the way we did it was unique. We never toured again. I went right back to record I Can't Drive 55, which ended up on my album VOA. That album was produced by Ted Templeman, Montrose's old record producer who had fronted me the budget for my first solo demos, and I recorded it at Fantasy Studios in Berkeley, this large orchestral room where Journey just finished recording their album Escape. I did all the demos at my little studio in my house in Mill Valley. David Wassler came over and laid down drum beats, and the two of us would spend 10 or 12 hours every day in my basement working up a bunch of new ideas. POA with I Can't Drive 55 really took off when it was released in August of 1984 and made my business ridiculously big. I Can't Drive 55 was not my biggest hit by any measure, but it means more than any song I've ever written. At the time, 55 only went to number 26 on the charts. It wasn't even a top 10 hit, but it was the one that really sold the records and kicked my concert business into the stratosphere. 
The tour for VOA was my most successful. I sold out arenas everywhere, two, three, or four nights some places, one of the top five grossing tours in 1984. Right up there with Van Halen, who broke at the same time with Jump and all that. I remember getting an award in Portland, Oregon. I sold out two nights and got the show of the year. Van Halen was runner-up. We were neck and neck on the road. They had a much bigger record. My album was 1.6 million, but they ended up selling 10 million records. My records were never up to my box office. There would be a guy like Greg Kinn or Tommy Two-Tone who had this moment where he sold as many records as I ever did. Maybe even more. But they could never sell out arenas, and I could go out and do multiple arenas. I was a live performer who came up as an opening act. My albums were just ways to get me back out on tour until I met John Kowadner and Geffen who got my records going. Kowadner and Geffen also got me doing music videos which pushed my VOA tour even more. The video to I Can't Drive 55 was huge on MTV, doubled or tripled my box office business and did for me instantly what radio never did. It made me a star. The All Music Cable Channel started in 1981, but it took a few years for the idea to catch on with local cable companies and the public. Once MTV did catch on, it had incredible power, and making videos was almost as important as making records. Three Lock Box had been my first video in 1982, and I noticed it changed me from being relatively anonymous to anyone but my fans to someone that old ladies recognize walking through airports, but the I Can Drive 55 video took everything to a new level. Kowadner put me together with director Gil Bettman, who had done great car scenes as director of the TV series Knight Rider. It was like shooting a movie, quarter million dollar budget, four day shoot, 12 hour days, at different locations all over Southern California. We rented a wing of an old hospital in Los Angeles and built a jail, put up bars, and a courthouse where the judge sat and the old lady hit me with the umbrella. We used real California Highway Patrol officers in one shot where they wrestled me down on the hood of the car. I got to drive my Boxer 512 flat out. We went out in the desert by Palmdale where I could go 170 miles per hour. Gil dug holes in the ground and put cameras in them to drive over. That song changed my relationship with the California Highway Patrol. At that point in my life, I had had 36 tickets. My license taken away three times. I was paying $125,000 a year for car insurance because I had all these hot cars. I had been to traffic school. I had hired attorneys. I erased as much as I possibly could, legally and financially, and I was still in bad shape. I Can't Drive 55 changed everything. Since I wrote that song, I've maybe had two citations. I've been pulled over at least 40 times, stopped, and let go. Some of these stories are classic. I was driving my Ferrari one night from San Francisco to Malibu with Betsy. This was later during my first year with Van Halen and was rolling between 150 and 160 all the way down Highway 101. As I approached Santa Barbara in the OJ area where there are all these speed traps, I decided to cut my speed. I had been checking my rearview mirror the whole way and couldn't see anything behind me. Up ahead is a roadblock, two California Highway Patrol cars. I didn't think that there was any way this was for me when I pulled over. About the same time, a helicopter lands, and three other Highway Patrol cars pull up. They had been chasing me for a while. I just didn't know it. Those little 5 liter Mustangs are good for 140 miles per hour. Max. I was blowing them off so bad, I couldn't see them in my rearview mirror. The cop got out of his car, shaking with his gun in his hand. Get out of the car, he said. I got out. You better have a good excuse, he said. Sir, I did not have a good excuse, I said. I was just having a good time. I have a fast car. I've been to driving schools and taking racing car courses. I didn't think I was in danger. I was not reckless driving. He backed off and holstered his gun. He walked off, took off his hat, and wiped his brow, replaced his hat, and came back. Okay, how fast were you going, he asked. I was really going fast, I said. Probably about 150. He threw his hands in the air and marched back to his car to the other guys to confer. Everybody was worked up. My wife was in danger, one of the cops kept yelling at Betsy. Finally, the cop with the gun sent everybody else away. They took off. The guy took his hat off again and pulled me over to the hood of my car and leaned against it. He started telling me his troubles. He had looked at the license and knew who I was. You know, I've got kids and this is a really stressful job, he said. And here you are, a rock star. Your life's in your hands. You've got anything you want. 
I was chasing you down the road thinking, I want to kill this guy when I pull him over. And then you sit there so calm. You tell me how fast you were going. You didn't lie to me. He sat there forever singing the blues to me about his life. At the end, he stood up, put out his hand and said, Nice to meet you. The wackiest pullover ever. Just recently, I was blasting down 101 in Marin County, going to rehearse with my new band Chicken Foot, driving my Boxer 512 from the I Can't Drive 55 video, doing about 90 when I flew past a cop under the freeway. Sure enough, he pulls me over. I came to a stop on the side of the freeway and rolled down my window. He came up and squatted down, his dark visor going down on his helmet. He held up his radar gun, pointed it at my face, and it was flashing 55, 55, 55, 55. He pulled off his helmet, and he has the biggest eating grin on his face. I've been waiting for you, man, he said. All the fellows told me you're around here, and they see you all the time. I'm the biggest fan you've ever had. I just got out here from the south. I've been on the force for two months now, and I'm telling you, man, I've been looking for you, and I got you. You write a song like that and no telling what happens. I wish I was smart enough to say I'd done it on purpose. Even though I made a lot of money on that tour, I came home from it ready to take a year off and figure things out. Betsy was on my ass all the time. She wanted me off the road and we had just had Andrew. I told her we would buy a house out in the country. I went and looked at this place in Nicasio as well as a property in Big Sur. We were really going to go remote, trying to get off the grid. I had been reading this book, The Coming Hard Times, by this guy who said the banks were going to collapse, everything was going to fall apart, the bottom's going to come out of society, and gold was the only thing that would be valued. Paper money would be worth nothing. I really believe this. I was looking for a cabin in the woods with 100 acres, I was stocking up on food, I got guns, I had all my ammunition, not to kill people, but to eat. I learned how to kill animals, I went hunting all the time, I learned how to kill a deer and skin it. How to cure it and eat it. I was going to go Ted Nugent on everybody. I was going to hunt and fish. I was going to put a racetrack on the spread and have all my cars. The more I thought about things, the more I decided to stop the grind. Album tour, album tour, album tour for my wife and family. I was burned out. I had been on the road for more than 10 years, and before that, I had had a hard life. Work, work, work. Now I had everything going. I had my bike stores, my travel agency, my fire sprinkler business. I had my apartment buildings. My business manager had done a great job for me. I was set. I didn't even need any royalties. I was at a peak, and I felt like the king. I could do whatever I wanted. I had three million in the bank, and I could see daylight. I would do one more record and one more tour, put away another two million, and retire altogether. Between all the other businesses and the money I already had, it was not necessarily a lot of income, but certainly more than enough to live on. I was ready to give up everything. Betsy was pressuring me. I was seeing things her way. And then, Van Halen called. Well, that's the end of Chapter 6. Let me know what you thought of Chapter 6 in the comments. That does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Till then. Rock on.